top of the epoch to you all and welcome to another one of our virtual tours of outer space my name is josh i am broadcasting to you from my home but if you've been watching for many weeks you might notice i'm not wearing my vest i forgot it at work the california academy of sciences is now open my vest is currently there if you want to come check out not my vest necessarily but the entire museum you should swing by it's going to be a wonderful time for us to get to see audiences again it makes us so happy and while we are still waiting for our planetarium to reopen, we are delighted to be sending out our broadcasts to you from our homes to yours. You should definitely tune in, but you should also come and see us in person if you happen to be in the area. Looks like we have people tuning in from across the US though. So I understand if you live several states away, it's a bit of a schlep. I would like to take a moment though to welcome our folks from Open Space who look like we have at least one person tuned in. We are gonna be doing this virtual tour of outer space in the software Open Space, which is actually planetarium software that you can download at home. I think you can see right there, we have Venus looking down on it from above. Now, Venus is just one of the planets of our solar system and only one of the many locations you can travel to. It is a really fun program. If you're interested in checking out Open Space, you can download it at openspaceproject.com. Com. You can also join their uh, various ways of communicating with the programmers themselves, because this is a software that is still in development, still being created by the good folks at AMNH, NASA, and a variety of other institutions. So if you have suggestions or ideas or need tips or tricks, there are tons of resources available to you. Now, when we are flying around the solar system, I get to be our pilot, but today you are the captain. If there's some place in our solar system or beyond that you want to visit, by all means, throw those comments in the chat. Many of you know the drill. I would be happy to try and take you any place that piques your interest today. So where we are now is around the orbit of Venus, a mere, well, let's see, million or so kilometers away. Not too far in the scheme of space, but we are seeing something kind of cool. And that is, of course, the sun. And by cool, I mean absolutely not cool. It's really, really hot. But as we dive in back towards Venus opposite the sun, we get to see one of the things that makes Venus so cool, so interesting. We get to see something that is wrapped around the planet itself, and that is an atmosphere. How can we see an atmosphere? Atmospheres are invisible. Earth's atmosphere is tough for us to see. We can see water vapor trapped within it. But what we can see on Venus is this wonderful limbing effect and that little bit of spread of blue that's happening right around the edge. That is evidence of Venus's atmosphere. Now, Venus's atmosphere is so thick, we truly cannot see the surface, or at least we couldn't see the surface. There's been some really cool stuff, an image taken by the Parker Solar Probe of the surface of Venus from outside its clouds. That was an absolutely jaw-dropping image because we didn't know the Parker Solar Probe could do that. It was snapping a photo, hoping to get a little bit of evidence, test out its instruments, and all of a sudden we were looking underneath those clouds. That's a really awesome thing. My friend Holly at the museum often says the true words of discovery are not Eureka. It's, huh, that's weird. All too often, that seems to be how these amazing discoveries are made. An anomalous observation is what reveals something truly wonderful about our universe. So atmospheres are awesome. Venus has a great one. Unless anyone has another suggestion, I'm going to take you to another one of my favorite atmospheres in the solar system. Let's go check out Jupiter. Now, to say Jupiter has an atmosphere is something of a challenging statement. Some people would say Jupiter is a gaseous planet. Gaseous planets are made of gas. They don't have an atmosphere. They are an atmosphere. I think that's weird semantics. When you talk about the gaseous outer layers of a planet, I'd say you're talking about an atmosphere. When you're looking at the outer parts of Jupiter, you might call this its outer surface. You might call it its outer atmosphere. I would argue that the two are almost sort of interchangeable here. So looking at Jupiter and its I've just gotten myself into a, painted myself into a corner. Let's call it its air. That's an even more horrible scientific statement. You can see a lot of mixing colors. Now, again, this is an atmosphere that is visible to our eyes. We can see it. If you were a life form that evolved on Jupiter, maybe you would be able to see through it like we can see through our atmosphere. But for us and who adapted to life on our planet, Jupiter's atmosphere is pretty much completely opaque. Now, we did drop a probe from the Galileo mission down into the surface of Jupiter, and on the way down, it sent back some amazing stuff. There was a really cool planetarium show called Dark Universe that came out a while ago that showed us exactly what that would look like as you were settling in through the clouds, and it looks awesome. The sky is actually kind of blue. We imagine roiling, changing clouds underneath you, above you, maybe even lightning. There's all sorts of really cool stuff imagined about what the internal structure of Jupiter would look like. But... 
we're stuck with that word imagined. Even though we have collected some data, it was mostly about the chemical composition. Right now, the Juno mission is orbiting Jupiter and is really going to improve our understanding of the structure of Jupiter as a whole to really figure out what's going on inside the under parts, the under the atmosphere of Jupiter. We have a request from our friends at Open Space. Can you see my favorite moon of the week? Oh, I'm going to throw a little bit of a monkey wrench in my normal stuff and go visit a moon. And I'm not going to tell you where it is, but I'm going to say this is my favorite moon of the week, even though sometimes I don't even call it a moon. That's your first hint. So we're going to fly back a good way. I'm going to turn on some planetary orbit toggles. Let's see where the planet's trails actually are. And that's your last big hint. So I'm going to take us out to my moon of the week. And as we are flying there, see if you can figure out contextually exactly where we're going. You ready? Okay, Paolo has our next target. We're going to go check out Mars right after this. But as we're heading in, anybody know which moon we're visiting? We still got a good way to go. It's a small moon. We're getting closer. We're in the final 100,000 kilometers. There we go. Name that moon. So looking down here, guessing solely from its positional information, Michael has it. This is Sharon. You might wonder, huh, Sharon looks an awful lot like a cue ball floating in space. It's because I forgot to turn on the correct layers for it. So we are looking at some of the imagery for Sharon. If I turn on the color mapping, it should actually appear quite a bit redder, if I recall. There was a great, no, I haven't got that exact data loaded up. But there was a great deal of reddish stuff on the surface of Sharon. So why is this my favorite moon this week? It's got some astounding features. When we talk about Sharon, we are looking at imagery taken by the New Horizons mission. The New Horizons mission sent us some wonderfully high resolution images and ones, again, you can check out as flat images on NASA resources or as three dimensional images on things like open space. But looking around here, let's dive in a little bit. I'm a little spotty on my Sharonian geography or cheriography, but I'm going to say that this is probably the plane that was named for Mordor. And I say that because it's got a very unusual shape. It's sort of rectangular, just like the mountains that define the area of Mordor in the Lord of the Rings universe, or I should say on Arda, where the Lord of the Rings takes place. That's an unusual shape to see in geography. You don't see rectangles that often, and it happens to be dark. So I believe they named this one after Mordor. Really a cool thing if you are a Lord of the Rings fan like I am. Now, looking around here, you can see also some rills, some canyon-like structures, some very bright spots. A lot of these features were named for characters from science fiction and fantasy, especially kind of spooky fantasy, which I think is really cool. But when you're looking at Sharon, this is a surprisingly well-known world for the fact that it is so very far away. And I hesitate to call Pluto or Sharon a moon because it does have so much in common with Pluto. There's ideas that there might have been material exchange between the two once upon a time. Might even still be some happening to this day because there's a lot of similarly colored compounds across them. They are almost like companion worlds. So I would say most comfortably for me, whatever I call Pluto, I should call Sharon too. So if Pluto's a world, Sharon's a world. That makes sense to me. Calling Pluto a moon and Sharon a planet makes no sense. Calling Pluto a planet and Sharon a moon makes very little sense. So I like calling them both worlds. I think to me that makes the most sense. I might slip up and call one a planet from time to time, but I slip up a lot and call things things that they shouldn't be called. The other week I called Uranus Neptune and Neptune Uranus, and you folks were kind enough to point it out in the chat. So thank you. We are zooming back. I promised you Mars next, Paolo. I think that is a great idea. I always love checking out Mars. So when we go to Mars, we are seeing composite imagery from many different missions. And one of the fun things in open space, you can swap out the information you're looking at to see Mars as it is, as it was on these different photo sets. So we're largely going to be seeing sort of an all over surface imagery of Mars. But if I dive in a lot, you get to see this special CTX imagery which is a chance to see ultra high resolution spots on Mars. Not 
quite as wide coverage. There are definitely missing parts because taking ultra high res photos of the entirety of Mars is not something that's happened yet. I'm sure it is a high priority for folks to get a chance to get those high Im resolution images from all over. Okay. So when we're looking at Mars, you can see that kind of color variation, I think is the first thing that pops out to me. We call Mars a red planet, but I don't see any bright red in this image. I see light reddish, pinkish, brownish, grayish, darkish, all sorts of stuff. But I don't see a whole lot of like bright fire truck red. Turns out a lot of the reddish color we see is because of these oxides, iron oxide in the surface. But here's one of my favorite things on Mars. I've flown past this a bunch of times. I know when we had some of our Mars specialists, they told us exactly what caused a funny looking crater like this, but I can't remember if it was on our actual broadcast or on the practice for the broadcast. That's always a struggle for me. But when you look at this thing, would you call this a crater? I would love to know what you folks think in the chat. If you think this is a crater, how would a crater form such an unusually shaped region on the surface of Mars? I'm talking about this thing right here. It kind of looks like a tadpole, maybe looks like a, I don't know, squished, maybe like sub sandwich or something. I guess I'm kind of hungry looking at that. But it's an unusual feature to be sure. And I'm inclined to say it is probably impact related, but maybe a grazing impact or an irregularly shaped object. That is a really cool looking one. Looking around on Mars, you can see some of the top hits. My good buddy Olympus Mons hanging out here. And if we move past Olympus Mons, you can see the rest of the Tharsis volcanoes, kind of its backup singers. And then over here, you can see this wonderful feature called Valles Marineris. Now, Mariner Valley, Valles Marineris is so cool to look at, especially from the surface. So I'm going to take us in. And as I am doing so, just look at this wonderful effect of the atmosphere filling in the Valles Marineris region. So cool. So if you ever want to fly along and get to see the sunrise on the sides of Valles Marineris, Open Space is the software to check out. There's some really cool stuff to see. Okay. Can you show us who where Perseverance is right now? You're going to quiz me on craters. This seems an unnaturally cruel thing to do. It is in Jezero. I know the name. Let's see if I can find Jezero. I know it's on the opposite side-ish from Gale. Oh, boy. I'll tell you what. I think I might have a bookmark saved. I'm going to see if I can locate that. But while I'm looking for it, uh, let's see if I can find something else on the surface of Mars for you all. Let's see. Oh, wait, maybe I have it. Is this going to work? It is going to work. Yay. Thank goodness I don't delete anything from my computer. Wait, nope, that just latched us onto Mars. <laughs> I don't have that module loaded. Never mind. Okay. Uh, alas, Polo is Perseverance. I don't know if we can zoom in quite enough to see something that is approximately human sized. Layla wants to see Pan, Saturn's moon. I don't think I have moons as small as Pan loaded up, but let's go check out just in case I do. So when we're talking about Pan, for those of you who've never seen it, I cannot urge you strongly enough to go and check out actual pictures of Pan. Many of them were taken by Cassini from very up close, and you get to see an absolutely delightful shape. When you have a chance to look at it, I would love for you to go into the chat and drop a comment. Tell me exactly what you think Pan looks the most like because I have heard some wonderful guesses about what they think Pan resembles. So while I'm trying to get us there, uh -huh, Pan is not loaded up. So one of the reasons Pan looks so funny is that it is so tiny. Now on Earth, if I wanna build a really tall pile of sand, I also have to make the pile really, really wide. 
And that's because of Earth's what we call the coefficient of gravity, how much gravitational force you experience when you're on the surface of Earth. Now, when I go to a planet with higher gravity, maybe not Saturn, the one we're looking at, but Jupiter, I wouldn't be able to build as tall a sandcastle, or at least I'd have to make it wider if I want to make it tall. When you talk about someplace with very low gravity, like, well, Mars is a little lower, but someplace like Pluto, then you could build something that's very tall without having to worry about making it very wide at all. We see mountains like that on Pluto. But when you look at an image of Pan, check out that ridiculous ring all the way around it. It sticks out like a tutu. It kind of looks like Saturn because you got a round thing in the middle with a little disc sticking out the side. Pan is able to have that incredibly tall disc of material all wrapped around it because gravity is so low on this teeny tiny inky dinky moon. That's basically dust from the rings of Saturn that has settled down onto the surface of Pan and made it so that you can see this long radial ring extending out, kind of like a wall that would separate the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere, sort of like you see on the world of Game of Thrones or Westeros or Planetos, I guess. I'm doing a lot of science fiction and fantasy references this week. I didn't intend to. It's just happening. Okay, let's see. We had Mars. We had Pan. I'm sorry I can't show you Pan up close. Could we see the Milky Way from outside? Absolutely, Dan. That is one of my favorite things to do. I love looking at the Milky Way from outside. Actually, speaking of favorite things, I want to take a moment to plug this week on Friday, myself, our engineer par excellence, Dan Tell, and our senior director of Morrison Planetarium, Ryan Wyatt, are all going to be teaming up to show you some of our favorite things to visit in open space, kind of a hints from people who spend a fair amount of time under the hood and our favorite things to go looking for. So out here, I'm noticing, there we go. Our Milky Way is showing up. Ryan's gonna be telling you about some of his favorite things out at the Milky Way scale. I'm saving my favorite things for all around Earth because I do virtual tour of outer space. No one ever wants to go see Earth. They just wanna see outer space. So I get to tell you about some cool things we get to see on Earth. But looking around here, check this out. You can see the Milky Way from way far away and really see its structure, its composition. Take a moment and soak in the color of the Milky Way. I think this is really cool. When I look at the center, I see white, but kind of a yellowy white. When I look at the arms of the galaxy, I can see more colors. I can see blues, I can see reds, I can see little white specks throughout. I can see those dark clouds of material. That color actually tells you a ton. We see different groups, what we call families of stars in different parts of the galaxy. When you look at the generations of stars in the disk, this flat spirally part wandering around the center, we get to see young stars and old stars. We get to see newborn stars and dying stars. There's a lot of variation there. And we get to see the material that comes from dead stars and is going to give rise to new stars, that dark nebular material. So the blue stuff out here is very young stuff, stars that have just winked into existence. The reddish stuff is coming from some active hydrogen clouds, to be sure. They give off kind of that reddish, dullish glow. But also, red stars are very common, but very faint stars. We're probably not seeing too many of those from this distance away, though. They're not that bright. When you look down towards the center, you get to see those yellow and white stars. Well, those are old, what we call main sequence stars, stars that have lived for a very long time. Some of them are as old as our sun or older than our sun. Some of them might be up to almost, you know, a little over twice the age of our sun, but they might live to be 10 times the age of our sun. So looking at this, we get to see old ancient stars close to the center of our galaxy. That's what gives it that yellowy color. There aren't as many young stars. In the disk of the galaxy, we get to see young stars, blue stars that give it that distinctive color and the material that gives rise to future generations of stars. Now we know this about our galaxy from mapping the gas within it, but also by comparing it to other galaxies and other parts of the sky, it gives us a much better understanding. So while we might say that our sun is four and a half billion years old, we think it could live to be 10 billion years old. When I say 10 times that, we're talking about these little reddish stars that could live to be 
a hundred billion years old. But there's a problem why we haven't seen any hundred billion year old stars. The universe isn't that old yet. So we're going to have to wait for another 90 something billion years to start to see those stars wink out. So in our own solar system, we often call our sun a yellow star. Really, it's more white than it is yellow, but drawing a white crayon sun on a white piece of paper is profoundly unsatisfying. So we tend not to do that. We color the sun in yellow. It does have a lot of yellow light in it, but actually the color our sun makes the most of is green. Shout out to Jamal. But when we're talking about the color our sun makes the most of, green is right in the middle of the visible spectrum. It is the one our sun makes the most of. It just happens to make about as much red and blue as well. So we see those colors combined as white. Fun part about human vision. We had a suggestion from Paolo to see Alpha Centauri. Okay, so to do that, I'm actually going to go into our scene menu. I'm going to pop on under Milky Way some of our constellations. And when we do our constellations, we should be able to more readily identify our good buddies down here. Okay, so we're looking northish because I see Cassiopeia flying by. There's Auriga. I see an Orion. I see Sirius, the dog star, right up there. So if we want to find Alpha Centauri, I think we got to go in the other direction. Down, yep, there's Deneb, too far. Should be right over here. Okay, so looking at this part of the screen, oh no, I grabbed the menu. Never grab the menu. That leads to all sorts of shenanigans. Zooming back, we're looking at this part of the sky. What we are looking for is the star that is closest to us. So as we pull back, keep your eyes on this part of the sky. The star that is coming closest to our sun is going to be about four light years away. And that is going to be Alpha Centauri. So we know it's not that one because that one is serious. Must be that guy right there. Let me grab my open space window right there. So you wanted your Alpha Centauri. There is Alpha Centauri. Now, kind of a cool thing to think about the distances to stars and how bright they appear. Other nearby stars are Sirius and Procyon. Alpha Centauri is about four light years away. Sirius is usually thought of as about nine-ish light years away. And Procyon is about 11. But Sirius and Procyon are pretty close in brightness. It just happens to be that Procyon is much, much farther away. Procyon is also the goofiest constellation to look at in three dimensions. It's pretty goofy to look at from Earth, too, because it's just two stars connected. So it just looks like a straight line going through space. So Alpha Centauri, if we get close enough to it, I'm trying to do some fancy flying here. There we go. Is not one star. It's actually three stars all orbiting each other. So that is a trinary star system or a triple star system. These triple stars, two of them are main sequency stars, much like our own. One of them, I believe, is a red dwarf. And the red dwarf is actually closest to us than the other two. So that red dwarf is the closest star to the sun, which is why we call it Proxima. So Alpha Centauri is the bright star of the system. We call the whole system the Alpha Centauri system. Proxima is the closest star to us. And lo and behold, Proxima means closest in Latin. We had a question pop up. Is the image of our Milky Way galaxy true color on open space or modified color? Great phrasing, modified color. We hate saying false color. I would say that that is very close to a true color representation. Now, the caveat there being that we generally, as human beings looking at stars, aren't great at seeing color. So if you wanted to really see the color of the stars you're looking at, the best thing to do is take a slightly longer exposure. So I would say that those are true colors, just maybe slightly more saturated than our eyeballs are used to picking up. Okay. With that, I think we are pretty close to our end of our program and our own home. So I'm going to drop us off here at planet Earth. Can we do Earth next? I'm about to go to bed. I'd love to see it before I do. We got Earth. So Earth is a beautiful planet, one of my absolute personal favorites. Sneak preview for those of you who want to tune back in on Friday. We are going to visit some really cool art that is visible in satellite photography and even some structures built by non-humans that are visible in our own satellite imagery which I think is a super cool teaser. But with that, 
thank you all for tuning in. It is my absolute pleasure. Oh, I saw Dan ask one last question. Is it true that Betelgeuse is dimming because of the gas cloud blocking our view of it? That is the leading theory. So we saw Betelgeuse get weirdly faint a while ago. And now we think the star sort of indigestion burped out a big cloud of material. And that cloud came between us and the star, blocking some of our light from it. So it did dim in kind of a worrying way because a lot of people think Betelgeuse might be about to explode. So that was exciting. Maybe this is a symptom of getting ready to explode, but stars don't live on the same time frame we do. As we discussed before, billions of years is part of a star's lifetime, whereas for human beings, I don't even think we want to live for billions of years. That sounds like a really long time. But for Hugh, you should tune in Friday at 1130 Pacific time, and we are going to be doing our cosmic conversation. Uh, we will be flying around. These are three of the folks at Morrison Planetarium who spend a lot of time poking our wonderful software open space. So it should be a fun program. Thank you all for tuning in. Tune in on Friday if you have the opportunity. And if you want to find out more about the night sky and really cool stuff, tune in Thursday. Our own Bing Kwok is going to be doing a night sky update. On behalf of myself, Morrison Planetarium, and the open space team, thank you all for tuning in. It is so fun to do this program. I am always looking forward to it. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Happy St. Patrick's Day if you celebrate. And have a good night.